Good Friday. You may have noticed when you came in, we've moved the furniture a little bit. Um, <laughs> if you uh, if you want to if you want to come in, the cross is in the way. Just think about that statement for a little bit. The cross is in the way. This is a uh, depiction of a crucifix. Lots of faith groups use a crucifix that Nazarenes don't typically accept on Good Friday. There are faith groups who uh, really spend, put a lot of energy and put a lot of notice on the suffering of Jesus all the time. And uh, I just don't happen to be one of them. It's hard. It's hard. It's a hard thing for us to, uh, and it's for me anyway, it's a hard thing to spend a lot of time. I, I, it's too heavy. What Jesus went through physically is hard. But it was necessary. And that's what Good Friday is all about. It's taking a little time for us to ponder why. Why was this necessary? Why was a sacrifice needed? God is perfect in every way. Most of all in His holiness. God created you and every other person in creation. And although He fully loves His entire creation, including everyone in it, He cannot be in the presence of sin. And Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone has a problem. I think of it like this. It's as if the very first time you sinned, you forfeit your place forever in the presence of God. Although he fully loves you, instead, Satan now has a claim on your life. Your life has been promised to Satan by you. Because of sin, you have been identified with him and his world of rebellion. When your life, as you know it, is over, Satan will inherit you. And he, will, he has a plan of what he wants to do with you. But God doesn't want you to be lost. So God prescribed a substitute to satisfy his requirement for purity. Blood. Blood is life. God required a pure life to be given in your place in order for you to be able to be in his presence. We can read of that in Leviticus in many places. Leviticus 5.17 tells us, If anyone sins and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even if they don't know it, they are guilty and will be held responsible. They are to bring to the priest a guilt offering of a ram from the flock, one without defect and of the proper value. In this way, the priest will make atonement for them, for the wrong that they have committed, and they will be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. They have been guilty of wrongdoing against the Lord. The Jews believed, because God said so, that he would keep Satan at bay as long as they periodically offered a pure blood sacrifice in their place, a lamb. Each time they did this, they would drink a cup of wine and eat unleavened bread. They called it the Passover. John 13, 1 and 2 says it was Passover. It was before the Passover festival when Jesus, who knew the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Passover, of course, historically was a remembrance of the escape from Egypt when God delivered his people, the Israelites, from the slavery in Egypt, symbolically delivering them from their slavery to sin. That had been celebrated for generations. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, they were recognizing the Passover. 
in a way, you could say that's what we recognize here tonight as well. Tonight, it's a little different. Tonight, we recognize and remember the strangest event in human history. The night the Creator died for His creation. The people in attendance at the Last Supper were predominantly from a Jewish background. They had lived under God's covenant for generations. When any covenant was made between two parties, it was sealed with a cup. A toast of sorts. They would drink wine, metaphorically saying that we are in this together. We both agree to the terms of the covenant. When the Jews drank the cup at the Passover feast, they were symbolically agreeing to God's covenant. At the Last Supper, they drank from the cup and they ate the bread just like they had for generations. But this time, Jesus was making a new covenant. He had something different in mind. The cup symbolized His blood. And the bread symbolized his body. Jesus says in Luke 22, do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus prayed. He prayed that he would be glorified in order that the Father would also be glorified. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for all believers, for all time. In other words, he prayed for you and for me. And later, in the garden, Jesus prayed, we we can read this in Matthew 26, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, to the point of death. He fell to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup Jesus was speaking of was a metaphor. He was referring to the proposed solution to the earned wrath of God for all people. The justice that is required for the sin of humankind. It represents the life that is owed to the the deceiver. Promised in exchange for the freedom we have to exercise our betrayal of God. And Jesus willingly agreed to God's terms. Soon after Jesus was arrested, he was railroaded in farciful, farcical trials. He was brutally and despicably treated by soldiers. The Jewish leaders yelled out, We have no king but Caesar. The leaders of the Jewish faith aligned themselves and they identified with a man, a man who had set himself up as God. And then they said, let his blood be upon us and on our children. Little did they know. Then they led him away to be crucified. Soon after, darkness spread over the land. On the cross, Jesus prayed for those responsible. An almost unimaginable prayer. He prayed, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Was he praying for the Jews? The Romans? Us? The hours pass. One o'clock, two o'clock, almost three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No response. And then Jesus said, It is finished. And he cried in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And with that pronouncement, 
he died. The soldiers and the crowd had never seen anything like this. While they were pondering what they had seen, this amazing man die, a violent earthquake took place. And the centurion exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Probably thinking, what have we done? Be that as it may, Jesus was dead. And outside of a small collection of working soldiers, gloating religious leaders, and a few grieving women, the rest of the world didn't even know. In fact, while most of the Jewish world ceremoniously sacrificed a Passover lamb for their sins, again, the sacrificial lamb was sacrificed for all sin, for all time. And the world didn't even know what had been done for them. And we call this Good Friday. The world was without Jesus. The cross is empty. He was gone. What's so good about that? Well, his death brought about the full payment of our sin debt. He is our sacrificial lamb. In other words, you no longer belong to Satan. Jesus was dead, but we are free. The body on the cross was for you. And the body on the cross was for me. And everyone who believes that that's true. Our sin debt has been satisfied. Romans 3, 22 through 24 says, The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, it is finished, he was talking about sin. The call of sin on our lives. The claim of sin on our lives. Our slavery to it. Our separation of God, our separation from God because of it. All of this ended with the death of Jesus on a cross. Now, don't get me wrong. Satan still wants your blood. But now, the cross is in the way. The cup of God's wrath is empty. The need for your blood, because you belong to Satan, is gone. Someone else's blood was given in your place on a cross. Therefore, a lamb is no longer required. Satan still wants you, but let me remind you of this. Satan doesn't care about you. Satan could care less about you individually. It's God that he wants. You, me, all of us, all people who have ever lived are just tools. We're just pawns. Satan wants to get at God. Satan doesn't care about you at all, but Jesus does. In fact, Jesus loves you so much that he died for your sins and mine in our place. Death is still out there. Physically, all of us, unless the Lord comes quickly, all of us are going to die. But now, the cross is in the way. The plan Satan has for you is a little confused. Because now there's a cross in the way. He paid the penalty. And most of the world doesn't even know it. All you have to do is trust him and accept the gift. And most of the world doesn't know it. 
tonight we will have communion. But before we do that, I want you to understand, make sure we remember this, by undertaking the bread and the cup, you are identifying yourself with God. You're saying that you want to turn from the dominion of darkness and embrace the freedom Jesus purchased for you with his own blood. Life everlasting in the pleasure and the presence of God has been purchased for you. There's a cross in the way. You can't have everything that God wants for you without the cross. That's the only thing that's required. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. That's all that he asked in return. And if you agree to his terms, then I invite you to this table. And I know there's lots of different ways that we could do this. Um, since we're a fairly small group, if you're able, I'd like for everybody just to come around the table. I think there's something symbolic about that when we gather around the table together. And uh, I'll pass out the elements, and then we'll all receive them together, if that's all right. Does that sound like a good plan? All right, so everybody, if you'd like to come. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus gathered his disciples together. He took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take this, eat it, and you do so, do so in remembrance of me for the remission of your sins. my blood, which is shed for you. Take and drink it, and as you do, remember me for the remission of your sins. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we cannot imagine what you endured for us. We can't get our heads around why you would do what you did for us. Lord, we just can't imagine that you would love us that much. And you would have done it for each one of us individually, but you did it for everyone. Lord, I pray that you will help us to focus on you Remember what you have done, not make light of it, not forget about it. Lord, I pray that you will help us to remember that there's a world out there of people who don't even know what you have done. Lord, I pray that you will help us to stay focused. I pray that you will help us to identify ourselves with you. Help us to align ourselves with you, with your mission. Lord, may everything that we do in our lives glorify you and bring you honor. Lord, and help us to every day with every decision we make 
make it clear to the world that we agree with your terms. Lord, we want to be with you. We want to please you and we want to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, we're almost finished. We can just hang out if it's okay. <laughs> Remember, the price that was paid for you was a person. And he believed that you were worth it. God made into flesh. The communion cup is empty. So is the cross. And so is any claim that Satan ever had on your life. No sacrificial lamb could fully and finally finish the debt that Jesus did. But he did. Let's go from this place tonight fully aware of who we are in Christ, what he has done for us, knowing that we have nothing to fear and our future is bright. Because not only is the communion cup empty, and the cross is empty, so is the tomb. We'll talk about that on Sunday. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you for coming.